Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat, and I've got no doubt that the title you're seeing on today's video will be a bit of a clue as to what we're going to be doing in it because it is Q&A time. First up, I want to say a massive thank you to everybody who took the time to go over to my post on YouTube to put in a comment a question that you would like me to answer. My goodness, there were a lot of them. I'm going to try and cover as many as I can today. As is so often the case, when I come to this channel, when I look through my posts and my comments, I remember and I think about just how lucky I am to have this community. And it is a very frequent occurrence because, my goodness, you are so supportive, so kind, but also so insightful. It's a frequent occurrence that I really rethink things because of comments that have been put beneath one of my videos or one of my posts. And for that, I am truly grateful. In addition to lots of great questions, I also got some fabulous suggestions for future videos, which I won't be talking about in today's video for time, but also because I want to make whole videos about them. So they have all gone onto my list for the future. So once again, thank you so much. And I hope you're going to enjoy what I have for you today. But before we jump into these questions, I want to say an absolutely massive thank you to History Hit for sponsoring another video on this channel. This week, I really enjoyed watching this panel discussion about Mary Tudor and what might have happened if she had lived longer. I love this episode and I know that you will too. History Hit brings you the stories that shape the world through their award-winning online history channel and podcast network. It's like Netflix, but it's all history. With History Hit, you can stream and download hundreds of hours of original history documentaries anywhere, anytime, on any device. You can watch on your mobile, tablet, desktop, Xbox or your TV. Brought to you by expert historians such as Dan Snow, Professor Susanna Lipscomb, Dan Jones and more. And as well as already having hundreds of expert-led programmes, they add two more every week. With Christmas being only a few days away, depending on when you're watching this video, perhaps you are still on the hunt for the perfect gift for a person or indeed people in your life. Well, never fear, because History Hit is on hand to help you out. Viewers in the United Kingdom can make use of a special deal that will allow you to get a subscription to History Hit in a bundle with the fabulous History Hit Miscellany. And that's a book that I've talked about a few times on this channel. There are a selection of gift subscriptions and bundles for UK and international viewers to check out through the link that I will be leaving below. Thanks again to History Hit for sponsoring this video. But now it's time for me to dive into your questions and to hopefully give you some helpful answers. So I have got my tablet and I'm going to go through the comments on that post and we're going to get through as many questions as we can before it's time for me to go and pick up my son. These are going to be approached in the order they appear on my tablet. Right, so question one. Looking back, did you expect reading the past to have grown and achieved as much as it has? What does this channel and its growing community mean to you? How much joy have the channel and its community given you? And have you achieved what you set up to do or had hoped for when starting up this channel? So this is a really big question. And in some ways, this is absolutely what I hoped would happen with the channel. You don't, no one makes content with the impression or hope that no one's going to watch it. So I always wanted to build a community. I certainly didn't expect for the community to grow as quickly as it did in 2020, particularly. So at the start of 2020, I had a little over 300 subscribers and I was astounded that in the time between 2018 and 2020, I had a little over 300 subscribers who were watching my content, commenting. I was 
so impressed that people wanted to see what I was talking about. And I felt really good about myself that the stuff I was making was speaking to people because I started this channel as an outlet for my historical knowledge, for my historical passion in a time when I left the academy. I didn't really know what I was going to do with my training. So this was the place that I could put it. And the fact that anybody wanted to talk to me about it just filled me with so much joy. And then in 2020, with everything that happened, with the world shutting down, with being pregnant, um, with trying to buy a house, with all of my freelance work going away, it was a really weird time, I think, for everybody. And the fact that in that time, while in lockdown, my channel went from having a little over 300 subscribers to by the time my son was born, it had 60,000 subscribers, was, I think, understandably, <laughs> unexpected. In, in, I felt incredibly chuffed and grateful and all of the rest of it. But I had no idea what that might mean and the opportunities it might open up for me. And the fact that it has, and it continues to do so, and it continues to grow, I'm still massively navigating what this might mean and, and what I can potentially do with it. Um, but yes, so to answer your question, I have achieved in part what I wanted to achieve. And a large amount of that is that I have found this community of people I hope that I've shared some things that were lesser known. I hope that in some contexts and cases, I've offered information or thoughts that perhaps people hadn't thought that way before. I hope I've challenged. I hope that I've spurred other people's passions for history, maybe started some passions for history. But most importantly, I look at the way that all of you interact with each other in my premieres, in my live chats, and in my comment section. And I feel like we do have a, a place where we're sharing. And I'm really pleased with that. And I hope that you are too. And I hope that you're going to stick around. So thank you. Of all the great personalities you've covered on this channel, who would you most like to have met and or who do you admire the most? Also, given the chance, what place and time period would you visit? And then you say thank you for the hard work and for being a delight to listen to and watch. Well, thank you ever so much. That's very kind of you. Who would I like to meet? There are a lot. So and I, I'm going to just go with the one that immediately sprung to my mind, and that's Bess of Hardwick. And I've probably mentioned her before, I don't know if I'd like her. I've got a video on her, which I will leave linked. I don't know if I'd like her, but I would want to meet her and just sort of see what she's like. And I think it'd be really fun to go and visit her when her refurbished Hardwick Hall has just been built. So that's the sort of time and place I'd like to go back to. I would love Bess of Hardwick to give me a guided tour around her newly refurbed Hardwick Hall. I think she would be pretty fun. Can you talk about the process of identifying who is in historic portraits, like when they don't know if a portrait is of Catherine Howard or not, etc.? So this is not something that I do professionally, but my understanding based upon some examples that I have encountered or that I've been told about is that it's a combination of things. So dating when the painting was made through various assessments and analyses of the materials that have gone into creating the portrait as a whole. So whether that's paints, canvas, etc. And then on top of that, it's looking through documents and records to see who's paying certain artists. So in some cases, it's about, first of all, identifying the artist, identifying the time period to as close and as small a period range as possible. Then it's about looking at the records of people and seeing who is being paid, if that artist is being paid, and who they're being paid to paint in that period. That then theoretically narrows it down. By looking at somebody's face and how they're being presented and the fashions they're wearing, you probably have a fair idea about who they are. First of all, you're going to know if they're male or female. So if you've got a, a portrait of a woman 
all of the people who are connected to that artist from that period who are male, you then discount. Then you've got the women. Then you start thinking, well, is this a very young woman? Is this somebody who appears to be of maternal age? Or is this someone older? And then you can start shredding it down through there. On occasion, I believe a portrait of Catherine Parr was re-identified and perhaps having been misidentified previously based upon jewellery that was being worn. You can, for example, make assessments based upon the fabrics being worn. There are certain fabrics, obviously, based upon sumptuary law, which I will be talking about in a further video, perhaps a glossary video. You know that certain ranks of people can't wear particular colours or fabrics. So when you see that in a painting, that puts that person in a particular social class. So all of those things combine in some cases, to give a best guess at who this person might be. But in other cases, it can be quite a clear indication of who this person was. And so it goes from being attributed to be, to being accepted as being. So I hope that helps. But yeah, there's there's a variety of ways that you can potentially connect a person to a painting. And some are more credible than others. And the more evidence you have, the more that credibility increases and the more the acceptance of that attribution is. Besides history, did you ever have another career you were interested in? What made you decide on history as a career? Uh, you love history, it's always been an interest of yours, and that you love doing research. You have a question about something, it opens more questions, you get sucked in, and you also uh, wish me and my family well. Thank you ever so much. So I did have some other careers that I was interested in, and they flip-flopped around in my brain until actually fairly late on. And part of that is because, of course, I studied for so long. So I was knocking 30 when I finished at university. And that gives you a lot of space and time, I think, to formulate and percolate different ideas. Some other careers that I was more seriously considering, I was very interested by the law. I was particularly interested by criminal defence and for a long time I thought I was going to go and study law and hopefully become a barrister and that carried on until quite late. In fact, I did do some work experience with the father of one of my friends and he worked in criminal defence so I got to go to court and things like that. I found that really interesting and that may also have spurred my interest in true crime, which I still have. The other career that I was very keen on was performance. I was interested in perhaps becoming an actor. In fact, after my BA, I very nearly applied to drama school, but I thought, no, no, I'll do an academic MA because <laughs> I'm laughing thinking about it, because that's where there is job security in academia. This is what happens when you are the first generation in your immediate family to go to university and particularly to then take higher degrees at university because nobody that I was related to had any idea what it actually meant to do a master's and a PhD and then try to get a job in the academy or indeed what a job in the academy looked like. So I thought that job security came with a master's academically rather than a master's in performance. And as things have turned out, I wouldn't change it. But I must say, when I was a few years deep into the doctorate, I did think, well, <laughs> perhaps this may not have been the job security I was expecting. Anyway, on, onwards and upwards. So yes, there was a time when I wanted to be an actor. And there was another time, connected, I suppose, where I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. And I did host some comedy nights in Brighton. I was part of an improv troupe. So yes, a misspent youth on the stage. And uh, I do enjoy it when I get to hang out with actors. I feel like I'm back in that time. It's always very fun. So I love text directing as much as I do. Would you ever do a series on Shakespeare's works, like a read-along or similar? I've never read it at school and I would love to do so now. I think it'd be fun to learn about them alongside just reading. That's a really excellent idea and I think it would be very fun to do. I will have a look into how I might go about that. I did see another question previously where somebody talked about me mentioning courses and running courses through my website and I did want to do a course on Shakespeare. I'm wondering if there is some way that these two things could connect. 
I think I might have to check out other people's online courses and see how they're doing them. Because in my head, I think, oh, I'm going to run a course. I need to structure it like a university course. So seminars over 12 weeks um, with potentially a reading list, etc. But I'm not 100% sure if that would work online and through a platform like this. So I'm going to check it out. Watch this space. Henry VIII will be forever linked and remembered for his six wives and even overshadowed by them. Is there any part of Henry's reign or aspect to his character that has been overshadowed and should be looked at and remembered more? To be fair, there was a lot more to the man and king than his relationships. And I couldn't agree more. Of course, he is a human being. He is more than just this one aspect of his life. What I will say is, that there have been texts and parts of books looking at the six wives, but also separate books that look at Henry as a child, as a scholar, as a son, as a father, as a person who loves the arts, a poet, a songwriter, somebody who is incredibly sporty and athletic, his love of armour, the way in which he builds his navy, his military aspirations and developments, the things that he puts into place when it comes to palace building. There's a lot of talk about his building works and his acquisition of buildings. I think, though, the six wives are always going to be the thing that overshadows Henry, whatever else he achieved. And in some ways, almost rightly so. Because the other things, understandably, I think, become footnotes. If we think of Richard I, the Lionheart, famously a crusader king, spends very little time in England. That's pretty much what he's famous for, best known for. That's what he pops up in Robin Hood, for example, against the backdrop of bad King John. Richard I is the good guy who's not really here very much. If we think about Henry V and his successes at war in France, that's what he's remembered for. He is this warrior king, this person who reclaims English honour on French soil. I firmly believe that if Henry VIII had done similar things, achieved similar things to Richard I and Henry V, but had still had six wives and executed two of them, we would not be talking about him the way we talk about Richard I or Henry V. We would still be predominantly remembering him for his wives because the way he acts in that context is so peculiar, so out of the ordinary, in relation to other people, his contemporaries, but also throughout history. It is remarkable that he does these things. And so I think that's probably why, rightly, in a way, this part of the narrative does overshadow others. With that being said, there has been some work done on the other parts, not exclusively either in the stories about the six wives. So sometimes you just get the other information. But there have been less books and certainly less documentaries made about that. What's your go-to resource when you're researching something you don't know a lot about? Well, first of all, it depends. Am I talking about a person who I don't know much about? If they are British, then I will go to the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. That's a great place to start. That will have useful bibliographies. You will also see who they potentially connect to. So you can start fleshing out a family tree or a connections tree, if you will, through that. If it's a topic, I will hop on to JSTOR, Journal Store, and I will type in the topic name and I'll see the most recent scholarship on that period, on that event that I'm looking into. And I will see what people are talking about and the angle they're coming from. And I'll maybe read four or five articles and see where we're going from there. And then I'll look at the bibliographies and see what texts, books, primary sources that they've looked at. And I'll go and have a look myself. But that tends to be how I work when I don't know much about a particular topic. What is your favourite period for doing historical reenactment? Or what is your favourite history to interpret? That's a really tough one. And I think there's another question where it's, which character have I most enjoyed interpreting? And it's strange because I have played Tudor figures and I've had real fun interpreting in the Tudor world. But there is something about expanding your historical knowledge by interpreting as people who exist outside of the period that you are most expert in that is quite thrilling. 
So I did really enjoy interpreting as Joanna Farrar, who is somebody involved in the Peasants' Revolt. So medieval is great. I and other medieval figures. The costumes are also super comfortable if you interpret medieval because it's essentially a sack with fitted arms. They are lovely. I really enjoy Georgian, particularly Georgian court, Georgian royalty. Playing Caroline of Ansbach in a large court mantua with the panniers was so thrilling. There is something about being five foot four tall and six foot plus wide and having to go sideways through doors and seeing how members of the public respond to you wafting through palace rooms. That is really very thrilling. And on top of that, of course, Caroline of Ansbach happens to be one of my history heroes. I have made a video on her where I talk about her being essentially the best Georgian that we ever had. So I will leave that linked and perhaps you'll see why I loved interpreting as her so very much. Please ask Mr. Dr. Cat for his favourite historical figure and what he wants to know. Then bring him on your podcast. Well, your wish is my command. And by the magic of YouTube, here we go. Ta-da! So, first of all, thank you very much for thinking to ask me a question. That's very kind. Um, in terms of historical figures, there would have to be four. First, there would be Dippy, obviously the London Dippy at the London Natural History Museum. Uh, there was a four-year-old boy who walked in there. This was his first proper interaction with a dinosaur or a fossil of a dinosaur. And it completely blew my mind. And it started a lifelong love affair. Yeah, it's just a life-changing moment. Uh, the second historical figure uh, would have to be Utsi. Again, I was a child. I was coming up to my eighth birthday, 1991, Dr. Cat's birthday, funny enough. I didn't know at the time. Uh, Utsi was, the, was a calcolithic uh, man, almost preserved intact, discovered in ice. And about 5,000 years old, it completely captured my imagination. And I wanted to know everything about his life, his death, the work they were going to do to learn about him. Uh, it really did um, change me. Both of those uh, historical figures changed who I was and how I thought about the world. The third one is probably the most is definitely the most recent one of the four. Yuri Gagarin, the first man to go into space. There he was, uh, sat in a Soviet rocket, being prepared to be fired at the speed of a bullet. Off-world, um, several thousand tons of rocket fuel being ignited behind him, and he shouts, let's go. And what a better way to start an adventure. It's, again, something which stayed with me. I still start all my adventures by shouting, let's go. I don't do it in Russian. That'd be peculiar. But maybe I should start doing it in Russian. Play it, Carly. The fourth one, and this is very much fitting with uh, Dr. Cat's areas of passion uh, for history, and that would be Thomas Cromwell. He, so he comes from very humble origins. He went looking for adventure, supposedly, as a mercenary. It's never been fully proven. Um, and then found himself having to use law to solve the great problem of his time. And it was part of something which uh, changed a whole country. And I can see the impact of that change in uh, empire, Brexit, as well as our relationship with our national football team and the identity of the people that I share this country with and the people I share this city, uh, the, the playground that is London. It's, I think Thomas Cromwell's contribution to history is something which um, I think always goes a little bit underappreciated, maybe. The one question I would ask all of them would be, did they have any idea at the time of the importance that their, their life's work would have for the rest of humanity, or at least for me? So there you go. Thank you very much. If I could be any historical person, who would I want to be? And thank you for your kind words as well. When I get asked about where I'd like to visit, what I'd like to see, is there a period I'd like to live through? 
I I think share this opinion with a number of other historians and scholars that I I know and have spoken to, and that is, whatever the issues there are today, this is the time that I would want to live in the most. I think that we are on a march to progress. Things aren't perfect, but certainly in terms of illness, healthcare, the place of women, etc., this is the best time to be alive as it currently stands. So maybe I wouldn't go back into history. I'd like to hop forward in the future and see what's going on. So being an historical figure doesn't actually massively appeal to me because that would require living through a historical era. In terms of the best option for that, you're probably going to want to do a queen. I'd like to stay as a lady just because. So I think if I was going to live through a period as somebody, I'd probably like to live through a period as Queen Elizabeth I. I don't think I'd change anything that she did, but I would like to know what it actually was like for her, to see if I could get inside of her brain a little bit the choices that she was making, the fears that she felt. And perhaps on top of that, experience what it must have been like to walk through your court and your country, particularly in the later part of her reign, and to have people see you almost as semi-divine. What is it like to be goddess and queen? I would be interested in who in history you would invite to a dinner party, say a party of six and why. So I would like to have Cromwell and Shapwee, so Thomas Cromwell and Eustace Shapwee, because I would love to eavesdrop on their conversations. I think that would be very fun. I would like to have, as I said, I want to meet Bess Throckmorton. So let's have Bess Throckmorton and let's throw her in with Arbella Stewart her granddaughter, because I think there's going to be some fairly spicy conflict there. And I'd quite like to see how that relationship plays out. And then I would, I think, like to see a meeting that, despite what film tells you, never in fact happened. And I would put Elizabeth I next to Mary, Queen of Scots. I'm not sure if anybody would have much time to eat with all the shouting, but I kind of feel like Shapwee and Thomas Cromwell would be watching and observing with a fair amount of glee. And I I am inclined to think the whole thing would be fairly fun. But uh, I'm interested as well to know in the comments who you all would have at your dinner party. So do pop that in the comment section below as well. What is your favourite thing to cover in the history news of the month? For example, I love repatriations. What do you like? Well, I do find the repatriation segment really rewarding. I particularly like it when we have stories about repatriations actually happening rather than simply being requested. For that reason, I also like updates when I can fill you in on things we've talked about previously. But I also have to be completely honest that I am a magpie. And so when there is something lovely and shiny, particularly an item of jewellery or a gemstone, that has been found in a field by a meta detectorist or perhaps is going up for auction, they really do stick in my mind. I do very much enjoy a shiny thing. And for evidence of that, one of the stories or news items that really sticks in my mind is from ages ago, close to the start of when I started doing the history news, before it was alive when I was recording them, there was a story about an auction of Queen Victoria's mourning jewellery. And there were lots of incredible pieces, you know, storing hair of various members of her family that she'd lost. But the one that really sticks in my mind is the mourning jewellery piece to memorialise Alice. It was that one. I'll see if I can get a picture of it where it was a heart, a black enamelled heart with Alice in diamonds and it was sat at the centre of a crucifix. I still think about that brooch and I still wonder who bought it. I think at the time I said I kind of hoped it was Alice Cooper. If he is the one, that, because it was so goth. In fact, that brooch was the inspiration for my Queen Victoria goth AF 
merch range, which is available through the website. It was that brooch that did it. And it is just so goth. And I don't know if Alice Cooper bought it. And if he did, he's kept it quiet. So I'm a bit sad about that. So if anyone does know who bought the brooch, just let me know. I just want to see it with my own eyes just one more time. I definitely won't touch it. Promise. (laughs) I did get a few questions about the Prince in the Tower. Do I think the mystery will ever be solved? And based upon what I have seen, what is my opinion of what likely happened to the Prince in the Tower? So obviously this is a really hot topic at the moment. I am inclined to say I don't think, based upon what we have access to now, I don't think that the mystery will ever be solved. There have, for example, been a lot of calls to exhume the human remains that are purported to be the princes that are now currently in Westminster Abbey. And I don't really know what exhuming them will achieve in terms of solving the cold case. Certainly, there is a chance that there is DNA in the bones, in the remains that could be used to identify them. We did, of course, see DNA testing when it came to the finding of Richard III, the king in the car park. So there is DNA samples on file. And I am by no means an expert in forensic analysis. However, things that I have read, I do believe that we may have issues with this. The bones have been handled, the remains have been handled on more than one occasion by people who were not forensically aware. Thus, cross-contamination of other people's DNA may be an issue. Additionally, I believe it to be the case that there are certain times and lengths of time whereby bones, in essence, drying out makes the extraction of DNA and the sequencing of that DNA far more complicated. But let's just say we do sequence that DNA. It is found that those boys are who they are marked as being. They are the princes. Well, then I still wouldn't think it's going to be case closed. I don't believe it's possible to essentially limit it down so very to a very small time scale as to when they passed away. I'm not sure if we can make it completely clear whether they passed away in their uncle's reign or in Henry VII's reign. Maybe we would be able to get that close of an analysis but I don't think it's that exact of a science. I think the age range, the time range is slightly broader than we would need, particularly for boys who were of the ages they were at. On top of that, it's not going to prove, I don't think, whether they died of human intervention or natural causes, because the vast majority of things are not going to be marked on the bone. So at best, we can prove they are who we think they are we may possibly be able to link them to a time of death that might make it evident whose reign they died in. We almost certainly will not get a cause of death. I would be amazed if we did. So then, in that case, it's simply not case closed any more than it already is. My question and concern becomes, if we were to exhume them and we were to find they weren't the prince in the tower, Then we have the human remains of two other, presumably children, who are now nameless. We can't put them back in Westminster Abbey. That corner of Westminster Abbey is part of our national heritage. The mausoleum part of it, the memorial part of it, is many, many hundreds of years old. So at that point, are we then desecrating a grave What are we going to do with the remains? Where do they end up? So I understand the curiosity, but simple curiosity, to my mind, isn't enough to involve yourself and to potentially desecrate a resting place. In terms of the evidence that I have seen so far, I don't think that the boys survived into adulthood. I think it's most likely that they died in their Uncle Richard III's reign. However, I am quite intrigued by the idea, the notion that perhaps they died of natural causes. 
Erasmus talks about the sweating sickness in the summer those boys disappear. Now, why that's interesting to me is that the sweating sickness isn't officially recorded as the English sweating sickness until a year or two later. So to my mind, what we potentially have, if Erasmus is correct, is a previously unknown illness. And to be fair, we still don't completely know what the sweating sickness is. But at that point, a completely unknown illness that acts with terrifying speed, the old phrase, merry at breakfast and dead by dinner, killing two sons of a former king towards the start of a reign of their uncle, who some might argue had usurped them. Those kinds of illnesses, to some people, might feel quite judgment of Goddy. And so to me, that potentially explains their deaths, their disappearance, and also the potential cover-up. We can't say why they've died, but if word gets out it's, it's some unknown illness, that could be very bad PR for Richard. That to me also explains why George, Duke of Clarence's son, Warwick, wasn't affected, wasn't part of this disappearance, because It wasn't a murder of potential heirs. It was an illness that created fear and anxiety that was then covered up. But that is just my opinion, and that is something that I'm quite interested in. It's not going to be case closed. And I think that anybody who claims it is, is being somewhat disingenuous. Are there any Tudor artefacts you haven't seen but are itching to see in person? And then you've got a cheeky second add-on question. Which place with Tudor connections do you feel most connected to from the Tudor era? Well, actually, the artefact that I was itching to see for the longest, I did see at the British Library at the Elizabeth and Mary exhibition, because I have long wanted to see the Checkers Ring. If I can get a picture, I will pop it up on screen. So for those of you who don't know, the Checkers Ring is, it's utterly tiny. It was worn by Elizabeth I. Her fingers, there's a lot of talk about how delicate and dainty her fingers were. If you ever get the chance to see the Checkers Ring, and it's, not Checkers is the I suppose, summer home of the British Prime Minister. So it's almost a private collection, but also held for the nation. So it doesn't come out very often. If you see it in person, you will get this incredible understanding of just how small her fingers are. Now, my fingers are certainly not dainty, but I don't think the checkers ring would have gone much past the tip of my pinky finger. It is diminutive. And it's a locket ring. So when you open it up, you've got a relief cameo of Elizabeth and an unknown woman in a style of dress that is earlier than what Elizabeth is wearing. And lots of people agree that the other woman is in fact Anne Boleyn. Now, this has not been proven, but it's certainly the story that I prefer. And as for the place where I feel the most connected to the Tudor period, I'm definitely biased, but it's Hampton Court Palace. Particularly for me, in the Great Hall and the Great Watching Chamber, there's something about being in those spaces that just feels very alive with the cut and thrust, the bustle of court life, the conversations and gossip and backstabbing and standing in the great watching chamber, looking at the doors that once led to Henry's privy apartments. It's quite thrilling to think about this is the start of the processional route, that behind there is a private space, and then you come through and you're there potentially waiting for the king to take notice of you to answer your petition. And you feel that kind of fizzing in the atmosphere of possibility, but also danger. This next question, I'll be honest, kind of has me stumped, but I'm going to put it out there because I'm going to give my off the top of my head thoughts, but I'm really interested to know what you all think. Had he been alive, could Cardinal Wolsey have convinced Henry VIII not to execute Fisher and Moore? And would he have? And furthermore, would Cardinal Wolsey have signed the oath himself? I think that had Wolsey not died of an illness, the only way theoretically that he is going to stay alive is that 
he manages to annul Catherine and Henry's marriage. I think that he is being brought down to London at the time that he dies, where he is going to face a trial for treason. And I think he's probably going to be convicted. The only way he's going to slip that net is if he gives Henry what he wants. So with that being said, if the Pope grants the annulment, theoretically, there's no act of supremacy. So there's nothing for Fisher or Moore to refuse to sign, and so thus they live. But let's just say that somehow Wolsey is forgiven, and it comes to the fact that we still need to break from Rome as far as Henry's concerned, and there's going to be an act of supremacy. I think that Wolsey probably would have tried to stop Henry from doing these executions, but I think that he would have been sent back to York. So I don't think that Henry would have had him back in his company to have that influence. By the time he's been sent up to York and effectively rusticated, and then he's being drawn back to London to face these charges, if he got out of that, he's being sent back to York. I don't believe he would have had the influence. Had he had it, he probably almost certainly would have tried to defend them. I also think that if he had then been asked, or rather coerced, to sign the act, by that point, I think he probably wouldn't. What I think is interesting, and a follow-up question, is without the fall and death of Cardinal Wolsey, would Thomas Cromwell have remained in his household and remained loyal to him? So thus, there wouldn't necessarily have been Cromwell's influence at the Henrician court. And without Cromwell's influence at the Henrician court, would we have seen Cranmer's rise to power? And without that, would there have been the annulment? I'm very interested to see your takes on these parts of the question, but maybe this should be a what if or a counterfactual history video. Let me know if you'd like me to do, expand on this and sort of deep dive into the various nooks and crannies, because the more I thought about this question, the more nooks and crannies there were. A few quick fire questions here. Who's your second favourite animated Disney character? We all know your first by now. For those of you who don't know, this is a reference to my crush on the Robin Hood fox from Disney's Robin Hood. My next favourite animated Disney character, I am almost certainly biased by the fact that my son is obsessed with Elsa. So in this house... I might have a personal preference for Robin Hood, but we we stand Elsa and we stand her hard. That boy that boy loves him some Elsa. Do you and your family have any fun holiday or winter traditions you'd like to tell us about? Well, we're sort of making the new traditions. So one of our traditions is that we love a gonk in this house. My husband, we started off with a Christmas gonk. I saw one in IKEA and I was like, let's have that. My husband's now run with this. So actually we have a gonk for all the seasons of the year. And the gonk sits on the stairs because I wasn't particularly comfortable with starting Elf on the Shelf. So we instead (laughs) have Gonk on the Wonk. And basically Gonk on the Wonk, rather than Elf on the Shelf, who's supposed to report back to Santa, the gonk is here year round in various forms. And it's Gabriel's job to look after him. And that's all. And because he looks after him, the gonk will tell Santa that Gabriel's been a caring boy and he's been careful of him. And that is, we don't necessarily position Santa as a reward or a negative thing. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to steer clear on of Elf on the Shelf. But also because I've seen the, the absolute torments people go through by about year three when they've run out of ideas. So I'm just not going to start it. We've done our own and it's gonk on the wonk and we're very happy with him. Have I thought about a historical road trip for the channel? Maybe a few minutes of film each visit, but that way it puts together a nice ready-made trip for all of us to take on our own. That is a really cool idea. That's a really excellent idea. And maybe I can sit down with my lovely friend Philippa from British History Tours 
and she could tell me how I could go about that. That would be cool. That's a video idea. Thank you for that. What's your favourite tea and what do you take it in? Well, obviously, my favourite tea is piping hot historical gossip. But in all seriousness, I just like what we call a builder's tea, which I think is called English breakfast tea elsewhere. I like Yorkshire tea bags. That works best with the water we have here. And I like it in a mug with not too much milk. Don't give me anemic tea. Make sure it actually brews. And if anybody tries to put tea in a microwave, criminal (laughs) offence. Should be a criminal offence to mess up tea that badly. (laughs) What are your top three historical fiction books? It's, you know, it's hard to boil it down to just three. I'm going to have to include the Wolf Hall trilogy as one book because I'm going to. So Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall series is going to be one book. I also want to include something called Earthly Joys. It's a Philippa Gregory book and it's about the life of John Tredescant, who is a botanist and a gardener. And it's just, it's a really beautiful book. And the other book I'd like to recommend is called The Mermaid and Mrs. Hancock. And that's by Imogen Hermes Gower. And that is a really great book about somebody who finds an in quotes mermaid and puts it on display. Essentially, it's a really nice way to talk about and discuss what goes on to become the curiosity cabinets. And the curiosity cabinets, arguably, are the precursors of modern museums. I think it's a really fascinating period of history. So I do recommend checking those out. But perhaps you have your own recommendation for great historical fiction novels. If you do, drop those in the comments section, because I know that everybody will like to see that and to benefit from them, particularly if it's one they've not heard of. Why did Shakespeare's fame eclipse Marlowe's and what were the most famous men of the era? This is a brilliant question and there's not really an easy answer for it in terms of what's going on in the period because certainly one of the most famous plays and most popular plays at the time is one of Marlowe's. Tamburlaine is an absolute riot throughout the theatres. It does incredibly well. Why does Shakespeare end up eclipsing Marlowe? I think there's possibly a few reasons for it. Number one, he lives long enough to produce a greater body of work, so longer than Marlowe. I think additionally, becoming a king's man in the reign of James I of England, 6th of Scots, is going to help that. If we fast forward to the Victorian period, to the 19th century, we have two things I think that are going on. We have the authorship debate. So Shakespeare is being pushed front and centre as this focus of essentially a conspiracy theory. People are looking at the plays a lot more. On top of that, there is an element to which Marlowe is obscured because of rumours about him being an atheist and essentially not a great role model. There are concerns about things in his plays. Shakespeare offers a much wider and potentially more neutral text that Victorians can enjoy. I think Marlowe feels a bit more dangerous for them. But in general, one of the reasons I believe that Shakespeare and indeed early modern drama persists in the way it does, and perhaps why we have come to see this as a peculiarity is the English Civil War. The fact that the theatres are closed by statute, that plays cannot be staged for that period of time, means that the progression of skill when it comes to playwrights is stopped dead. So while people like Marlowe and Shakespeare have those that come after them that are inspired by them, and there is this coterie of really talented playwrights in London, Johnson, Kidd, Decker, Marston, the list goes on and on and on. When there are no playhouses and plays are illegal, there's no reason for people to keep doing that work. And so when the playhouses reopen and people need dramas, they start going back to the early modern dramas that have occurred and that have been extant before that civil war. 
And Shakespeare has this enormous body of work, so he starts being staged. And what they really like about Shakespeare is they have this cross-dressing in lots of his comedies. And we now have women on the stage, and you can have women playing what gets known as the breeches parts, so it becomes additional titillation, if you will. And so those things, I think, all combine for early modern drama to hold the place it does, but particularly Shakespeare. I hope that is answering your question. How do you decide what goes on your shelves? Well, I am filming this before my bookshelf tour goes out, but you'll be watching it after the bookshelf tour has already gone out. So perhaps that in part has answered the question about the books, but I didn't really mention the trinkets. And what sits on my shelf in the way of trinkets are majoritively guilt gifts, as I call them, not because they're gilded, but gifts based upon guilt. Whenever my husband has travelled for work, I like him to bring me back what we call toot that I can fill my shelves with as a way of assuaging my rage that he has dared to leave me and uh, swan off gallivanting. I mean, working. But in my mind, he must give me gifts to say sorry. (laughs) I'm kidding. But it has become this little tradition whereby he brings me a present back. And we do call them guilt gifts because he's guilty for going away. (laughs) Who do I think leaves the flowers for Anne Boleyn in the chapel of St. Peter at Vincula? This one is a stumper because they are anonymous. I wonder if the yeoman warder body know. These are clearly an arrangement. I'm not sure of precisely when it started. I'm not sure if the person who is responsible is still alive. There is a possibility that this is being paid for by somebody as part of a bequeath in their will, that it will stop when the money runs out, of course. However, I lean to it being somebody connected to, or perhaps even the current Duke of Norfolk, who still bears, as part of his surname, the name Howard. But obviously, I can't prove that. Do you have a history crush? Now, you could read this question two ways. Perhaps you're asking me if I have a crush on anybody who lived in the past. And if that is what you're asking me, I think the answer is going to be no. The majority of people that I study are individuals for whom there is an entry in the historical record. The majority being monarchs, members of the royal family, politicians, nobles. And sometimes when you know enough, you know too much. And there are many who are worthy of my respect, I believe, worthy even of my admiration. But crush-worthy? Not for me. With that being said, I can say that I possibly have history crushes on people working in the field today. There is an incredible amount of public historians who are doing such fascinating work, some of whom I am privileged to call friends, some I have been lucky to make acquaintance of, and there are a few who I hope one day to meet so that I can swoon and generally fangirl. I am in awe of the quality of public history, of the variety of public history, and and the breadth of people who get involved in it, who dedicate their lives and their time frequently and often from other disciplines, who make the decision to come from the law or wherever else and make history their passion and make content either on YouTube or on History Hit or wheresoever else. And I just think the quality and calibre is so great and they're definitely crush worthy for me. What does 2024 hold for reading the past? Can you divulge any plans? There are no firm plans but I do want to kick up a gear. I want to film on location. I want to do interviews on location. I want to get into nooks and crannies and find out really interesting things to take you behind the scenes when and if I can. I would like to be more experimental. I would like to do more filming on location and to see where I can go with that. As I said, I have invested in some new equipment. I'm still figuring out how it works, 
I did a big test of it when I made my bookcase video. And of course, that was in a fairly safe environment because I didn't have to contend with weather and all of that kind of thing. So I need to get more up to speed, put these bits of equipment to a greater test. But that is what I hope is going to happen. I want to reach out to various heritage sites. So if anybody from a heritage site is watching this and you would like to talk to me, you want me to come and feature your heritage site, your house, your location on this channel, please do get in touch. My website is linked with a contact page. I would love to hear from you, um, but I also will be reaching out. I'm feeling quite brave. I've, I've frequently been scared to reach out and I'm always worried that people aren't going to want to talk to me. But, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get, right? My question is, where is the head of Queen Anne Boleyn? Well, to my knowledge, it is with her remains beneath the altar of St. Peter at Vincula in the space that is marked as being her resting place. Now, she wasn't always there. The chapel of St. Peter at Vincula, meaning St. Peter in Chains, was excavated in the 19th century. There needed to be some building work, some repair work done. And when the floor was lifted, a whole host of human remains were found. There is some question as to whether the remains marked as being Queen Anne Boleyn were in fact hers or whether they were misidentified. Assuming they were not misidentified, then her head is with her remains, to the best of my knowledge. And as long as they weren't misidentified, it is beneath the stone marked with her name with the rest of her remains. Bangers or mash? Well, I first and foremost wish to reject the question because it should be bangers and mash. No choice required. I'll have both, please. But if you are going to force me to pick, I do love a sausage sarni. So it might have to be bangers. But ideally, I would like it with mash. Or for that matter, chips. A carb, basically. <laughs> so healthy. <laughs> Have you ever considered writing historical fiction? If so, are there any historical figures you'd be tempted to write about? Yes and yes. I have for a few years been piecing together in my spare time, walking away for months in frustration, coming back to it the way it goes when you write fiction, I believe. There is somebody and I am working on a novel about her and she's fabulous and we don't know loads about her. We see her for about a 10-year period. I've not spoken about her on this channel. She is, I believe, the perfect person for historical fiction because we actually know so little about her. There's space to fill out the skeleton, if you will, of her story and layer it onto the known facts. She's Georgian, and I love her. And I'm not going to say any more until I get an agent or a book deal, and that frankly, could be a few years down the line, considering the pace I'm working at. But I want to keep her a secret as to why I'm working on her, because I think she's so cool that if I say it out loud, somebody else might write her book, and I'm worried they might write it better than I will. So um, that's why I'm going to keep it quiet, and I hope that's okay. How much has your channel changed you? Well, we started this with a question about, did I expect my channel to go this way? And I feel like this is a really connected and good way to end it because in some ways it follows on. As I said, this wasn't what I expected in the way it's happened. I'm so grateful. It's what I dreamed would happen. And in terms of has it changed me? Yes, I hope for the better. I, in fact, talked to my husband about this question and he agreed that he has seen me through this and through the support that I've had and through the wonderful comments and through the fact that people keep tuning in every week, he has seen my confidence in myself increase. It's worth pointing out that I do have a history with anxiety and depression and I've sought treatment for that. This period has been one period where my anxiety has been perhaps the most under control that it's been in my entire life. And I think that's potentially down to two things. One is that I have more professional belief in myself because this is working 
and it's working for so many of you. And that makes me feel really good about myself. And it keeps the voice in my head that comes from my imposter syndrome a little bit quiet. Don't get me wrong, in the half an hour before a video goes up, there is that voice in my head that gets a bit louder and sort of goes, today's the day when you get found out. Today's the day when everybody realises you shouldn't be listened to. It's an unpleasant voice, but it's quieter than it's been for years. And of course, the other thing that I have to credit with changing me is the fact that I became a mother. And I became a mother through a birth process that was traumatic (laughs) in the extreme. And so in general, I think I feel quite a lot braver after that, particularly as I had a fair amount of therapy for the trauma due to it. So all of this combined, 2020 did a lot to change me. And from my point of view, and for the personal peace that I feel, it changed me for the better. So what do you think of this Q&A? Would you like me to do another one of these in the future? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video. I would also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because that will boost the engagement. And the more engagement a video gets, the more YouTube shares it out, which in turn will help us to grow this already fabulous community. As we've been doing Q&As, and we've covered quite a few topics, I wonder if you pick an emoji that relates to a question that I've answered that most sticks out for you. You can also find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please do share it with your friends. And if you like my channel, let some pals know about it too. You can let me know you like this video in particular by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to this channel. And if you think you're subscribed, now's an ideal time to check to make sure that YouTube hasn't unsubscribed you against your will. And while you are there, checking, subscribing, perhaps resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down menu that will appear. So that way YouTube claims, allegedly, they will let you know when I've next uploaded, but also when I am next planning to go live, which I do to talk about the history news. And I know you are not going to want to miss that. Of course, we do now have our failsafe. If you head over to my website, www.katrinamarchant.com, it will be linked. You can add your email into my mailing list box that will put you on the mailing list and I can email you to let you know what I'm up to that way too. There are links in the email that you can follow. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.